quick start. Um, it's great to see so many people here this evening. We must have a big speaker. Um, it's absolutely, yeah, <laughs> absolutely delight this evening uh, to be joined by Catherine Day, who's an incredibly distinguished speaker. We're very grateful for all the time she gives to the Institute, so it's great to get her this evening. Very timely as well with the announcement during the week of the College of Commissioners. Um, I'm sure she has uh, great uh, insights to shed on what's happening. Um, the format this evening, Catherine's going to speak for about 15 and 20 minutes, then we'll open up to the floor. And uh, that session will be off the record, so Catherine's initial portion will be fully on the record, and then we go into an off the record session. Okay? Catherine? Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm sorry some of you have to stand, but uh, um, hopefully you can hear me at the back. So I'm delighted to be here. Um, as Dara says, it's a particularly uh, timely week to be talking about the changing of the guard and the priorities for the EU and I'm going to talk both about some of the policy issues and also some of the processes um, but what I want to do is to for the context of what I'm going to say is to say that I think um, the Commission but also all the new heads of institutions who are taking up new jobs in the coming weeks in, uh, in the, at the European level um, are really um, having to work in a context when there is a battle going on for what kind of society do we want to live in, what kind of politics do we want to have. And I'll talk a little bit about the pressures the EU is under internally and from outside. Um, but I think it's, um, that's the geopolitical context. Um, we see in the United States, uh, we see in Russia, we see with China, the return of the cult of the strong man, um, the one leader. Um, and uh, it's very obvious that in Europe we don't have one leader. That sometimes makes things complicated, it takes longer to arrive at a decision, but um, in the end I think it's a, a better way of um, working by compromise, trying to bring people on board and not being dependent on the whims and the quirks of just one person. But really um, a lot of what the European institutions will have to do in the next five years has to be understood in that context because there is a battle going on for what will the EU be like in the future. Will it go back to uh, individual countries run by strong, usually men, but not, not exclusively, I suppose? Um, uh, or will we manage to find the confidence in ourselves to continue with the model that we have? Um, and will we be able to make it sufficiently attractive to the voters? And if you keep that context in mind, I think it already explains some of the choices um, that, um, in particular, um, Ursula von der Leyen um, has been uh, reflecting in her choice of commissioners this week. Um, it is um, true, I think, that um, Europe, the European Union, um, is feeling, um, despite Brexit, is feeling a bit better about itself at the moment, because I think Brexit is actually making um, the general population as well as the political class across Europe um, realise again uh, that we can't take for granted what we have taken for granted, that the good things that come from the EU won't automatically be there if you tear up the EU. Um, and so I think um, this, is not, uh, this is not necessarily a bad time for a changing of the guard at the head of the institutions and hopefully new people um, will be able to bring new solutions to old problems. Um, and I'm going to start with the old problems because most of the big issues facing the new leaders um, ha have been around for quite a while. Um, and in my experience, national positions don't change very much over time or with changes of government except in moments of crisis. Um, so a lot of the the parameters of the problems will be there. What one has to hope is that new people coming with new energy and with new mandates um, will find it um, in them and together uh, to find uh, new solutions. So I want to start first with the issues because that's more important than the processes and the institutions. Um, and I think um, one of the first challenges is going to be to um, uh, recommit to the values that um, embody the European Union. They are under threat from inside. You can see all the um, difficulties with countries like Poland, Hungary, Romania, um, where there is a challenge to um, the multilateral way in which the EU works, but also to the primacy of EU law, 
um, and a general wanting to take the benefits without wanting to have to accommodate some of the inconveniences of membership um, that also brings the benefits. So that the, there are also challenges from the extreme right in several countries. Look at the National Front in France, look at the Netherlands, uh, look at the rise of the right in Germany. Um, so these are all internal challenges which are reflecting um, old problems, but also um, with people who are given uh, new impetus by the populism of Trump, even by the mood in, in the UK over Brexit, etc. Um, and then um, the, uh, the actual existence of the EU itself is under threat from outside. I mean, I think President Trump doesn't make much secret of his disdain for the EU, and um, he wouldn't be at all unhappy if it collapsed, and he's rather hoping that Brexit will be the beginning of the breakup of the EU. Similarly, Putin would much prefer to deal with uh, 27 uh, smaller individual European countries rather than to have to deal with the bloc that is the, the EU. And the Chinese um, have yet another variant on that, but also um, are, are ambivalent, I would say, in their attitude towards the, the, the size of the EU, the way the EU works, um, and the, even the existence of the EU. So values, I think, is a very, imp is a very, very big issue that um, the new uh, heads of the institutions are going to have to find a way to, to um, convince the public that the values are enduring and that the EU has the capacity to defend its values. Then there are what I've put under the heading of existential threats. Um, first of all, climate change. And you will have seen that President von der Leyen has um, set two overarching priorities for her commission. The first is dealing with climate change. And she has um, said that the commission will produce a new green deal in 100 days, that the EIB should become a climate bank. Um, I think that will be very interesting to see if they <laughs> fully take to that new role. She has also talked about um, carbon border taxes, which I think are, are quite a difficult issue. And maybe even the kind of uh, false good idea we will see, but we can come back to that if, if you're interested in discussing it in more detail. Um, also migration. Um, here too she has um, said that there will be, she will work for humane borders, for a new pact on migration, um, to build up the European border and coast guard, um, to build up Frontex, etc. I was very interested in her speech to the European Parliament in July when she told the story about um, a Syrian refugee who she had taken into her family and who was now doing very well and spoke German and was studying and all the rest of it. And I, I was very struck um, at the end of that part of her speech, she said, and one day he hopes to go home. Um, and if you look at that, combined with the outpouring of criticism from the parliament over the fact that um, one of the vice presidential portfolios, which is actually to deal with migration, doesn't have the word migration in the title. And a lot of people in the parliament are getting very agitated about the fact that she has called it defending or protecting our European way of life. So um, I think that that's going to be interesting to see how that gets worked out. Do we have um, a migration policy that welcomes people into Europe permanently, uh, providing we can choose who comes in and who doesn't? Um, or do we still see it as managing a refugee crisis where someday they will go home again? That, that's, um, I think, going to be one of the big issues. Um, even here in Ireland, where we take in a relatively small number, it's going to be an issue um, in the future. Um, another, I wasn't sure whether to put this under um, existential or more economic and political, but it's the whole um, issue of social policy. And here too, um, in her setting out her priorities, she has talked about a just transition fund, which I think is quite important, that regions or sections of society that are getting left behind, whether it's because of tra or damage, whether it's because of trade deals, whether it's because of technological development, but um, that implies um, a beefing up of the help, and so that's precisely so that nobody is left behind. She also has said things about having a minimum wage, European unemployment benefit, social reinsurance scheme, she wants to triple Erasmus, she wants to have a child guarantee, she wants to activate more the youth guarantee, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And again, that's a political response to um, the rise of populism in, in Europe and the rise of a kind of them and us um, feeling which is being actively 
worked up um, by the more extreme political parties. And I think that is going to be very important. And it's actually one of the few areas where I think the departure of the UK um, will have a, a positive effect on the EU agenda because the UK has been so anti any development of the social agenda um, that it has really um, contributed, I wouldn't say caused, but contributed to um, quite a mismatch between very strong economic powers at European level, very weak social powers, and the feeling that Brussels doesn't care about uh, ordinary people, cares more about bankers than it does about ordinary people and so on, you all know the, the, the song. Um, but I think um, if she um, really puts a strong emphasis on the social dimension of European membership, I think that will hopefully be positive in, in trying to um, bring, um, validate the agenda of the centre rather than the extremes. Um, there are lots of economic challenges, and I'm just going to mention them very, very quickly, and then in the discussion afterwards we can come back to them um, if, if, um, if you want to. First of all, one of the most immediate tasks for all the new institutions is going to be to fix the next budget of the European Union. Um, the seven-year budget that we have been working on runs out at the end of next year. Now, leaving aside the fact that if we have no deal with the UK, we will have a hole in the budget for 2020, we also have to work out um, post-Brexit what kind of um, budget does the EU want. I think, again, the negotiations will be much easier without the UK. They have always been the most intransigent on the budget. They've also been the smartest. I'd say they are the only member state that's able to, to second-guess the Commission on the numbers. No other member state is really... It's such a complicated budget. No other member state is really able to to work out the implications of tweaking it here or tweaking it there, but the British Treasury has always been past master at that. Um, and the budget negotiations are, are always excruciating, but this time I think there will be an extra political dimension, and you can see very clear um, warming up of a showdown with Eastern Europe. You know, if you don't share the values of the European Union, uh, why should you share the money? Why should the Western European countries uh, be generous to the East if the East doesn't share the basic values. That can be very ugly, but it's also sometimes necessary to spell out a few home truths, I think. Um, there will be more pressure on tax, which will be difficult for, for, for this country. Um, but I think um, the, the pressure on tax isn't only coming in, from inside the EU, it's also coming very strongly from the Americans. And while you can negotiate um, inside the EU on how and when things should happen. Um, the Americans or this particular administration are quite capable of pulling the rug from under everybody overnight. So I, I think all of that combined is going to make the tax issue um, very, very challenging. Now, the second um, big overarching theme that um, President von der Leyen has set is the whole digital agenda. And um, again, that um, it can be very technical but it's also about societal change. How do we adapt to um, the, the, the revolution that's going on? Um, and the issues will run from privacy. I mean, I think after a lot of um, uh, disparagement even, the GDPR has now turned out actually to be a rather good vehicle and has shown that the Europeans have done more and are willing to do more to protect uh, individual privacy than, than any other um, block in the world, but it will run from issues like that to artificial intelligence. Um, these are not areas that uh, traditional lawmakers are familiar with or even able to keep up with because the speed of change is much faster than traditional lawmaking. So there will be um, a big challenge for the Commission and um, from the Commission on then into the rest of the EU decision-making um, chain. Uh, trade, another big area, the engine of our growth and prosperity. Um, globalization has not been um, an unmixed blessing, it has a downside, um, but it has lifted literally billions out of poverty and it has been very good for, for Europe broadly speaking as well. But now we see a tendency to retrench, to be lured back by the siren calls of protectionism and again um, it will be a big challenge for the next commission and for Phil Hogan in his new uh, portfolio um, to try to um, keep the multilateral system going. Europe believes in a multilateral rules-based system rather than the might is right school um, of politics. Um, but we have to convince enough of the rest of the world 
and to stick with it and to breathe new life into the WTO. So that's going to be a big challenge. And it's also going to be a challenge to keep Europe open because there are lots of protectionist tendencies inside Europe as well. Um, and I think it's one of the things that does worry me about the departure of the UK. They were the big country that was committed to uh, keeping Europe open. Um, there are, it's much easier to persuade French and German politicians to go a bit more protectionist. Um, and it will be, that will be a challenge in the future for the smaller countries that rely on the open trading model to keep the EU open to the outside. And I personally am worried about the, all the talk now about having European champions and basically closing off um, the openness that used to be there, having, having less confidence in our own ability to compete internationally. So these are all kinds of pressures that the, the new commission will have to find the right way of managing. Um, lots of political pressures too. I mean, first of all, managing Brexit, it seems to be never ending. Um, there is a need to deal with that, and it will take several years, whatever happens, but also to begin to think about what kind of new relationship do we want to have with the UK outside of the European Union. Obviously, we want them to be close. We want a close economic relationship. Um, the UK and France are the two European countries that have some kind of meaningful defence capability. Uh, we will certainly, I think, want to have links there. Um, I think also um, the British will probably discover how much more European they are than some of them think at the moment when they're outside. Because if they look around all the international issues, they will see time and again that they will probably be um, more comfortable in supporting European positions than they will be in supporting American or any other positions you can think of. But that's going to take time to work out how to do it and it's going to um, need the building of, of a careful relationship which is less than membership but close to um, a, a very like-minded ally from lots of points of view. Um, it, there's also going to be a challenge of managing the UK outside the EU. If it does decide to um, turn itself into a kind of European Singapore and um, slash its corporation tax, uh, cut environmental standards, uh, not live up to the high food standards that they have at the moment, and there certainly are people in the UK who advocate that as a way of remaining competitive outside of the EU. That will, um, you can say it's their business, but it will have a big impact on the EU as one of its trading partners. So I come back again to a lot of this is, yes, it's about a power struggle, but it's also about trying to shape what tomorrow's world will be like. And the EU will have to be clever um, in terms of how it responds to provocation, challenge, and opportunity um, all rolled into one. Um, maybe I'll stop there, but since I want to keep an eye on the time, um, and just say something about the institutional changes. Um, because um, you would expect me, um, given um, my role as Secretary General of the Commission for 10 years, to say that institutions matter, but they do. Um, because institutions endure. Individuals matter too, but they come and go. But institutions matter because they can carry on from one change of government to the next, one change of commission to the next. Um, the, the general trends and ideas that, are, um, that, that are enable the European Union to deliver on its promises and its agenda. And um, we've seen in the composition of the new commission um, a concern overall for balance. Um, for, for political balance. So you have three vice presidents representing the three big political tendencies, the Christian Democrats, the Socialists, and the Liberals. Um, you have gender balance, um, which I think is quite an achievement of uh, von der Leyen because the two presidents I worked for had enormous difficulty in getting the member states to give them one third female commissioners. So she really has um, succeeded um, uh, and if you remember, President Juncker five years ago had to threaten to resign, having been nominated, because he couldn't get enough female commissioners. So it really is a, a big step forward. Um, and uh, she has also been very concerned and careful to try to get um, geographic balance and to make sure that she has involved commissioners from, East, from Eastern Europe um, in important portfolios and with vice presidential portfolios to try to show that she wants to have a single, to, to the commission to be a commission for a single Europe and not to go down the path of, of old divisions between East and West. Um, 
I think that um, it's not a done deal yet. We will see it's become a kind of almost um, hunting tradition now that the European Parliament takes out one or two commissioners. Um, if they would be satisfied with the change in the title of the portfolio of one or two, that would be cheap at the price, but we'll see what happens when, when the hearings start. Um, and sometimes people trip themselves up or skeletons come out of the closet or whatever. So it's not a done deal, but, but we will see. But I think the shape of the commission is clear. Um, the, the portfolio titles are interesting, as is the creation of a, ti of a, um, of a portfolio on defence and space. That, that is a sign of the times to some extent. It's also a reflection of losing the UK and it's um, also a question of American pressure to say that you know, the Europeans have to step up more to the plate and pay for their own defence. Um, and I think also probably a feeling that um, America is a less reliable ally, so we perhaps had better uh, invest more in our own uh, defence capacity for the future. Um, I think it will be interesting to see how um, such a, a balance-driven commission will actually settle down. Um, compared to the current commission, um, she has made one change which I think will prove to be important and I hope will help to um, um, get more focus and direction in the work of the commission. And that is, in, a, in addition to having eight vice presidents, she has given two, three of them um, the power to directly intervene in what DGs are doing. And that has been a difficulty up to now, um, with um, both commissioners and directors general kind of conspiring not to tell the president what they're working on, working with um, external or representatives, lobbies, etc., and hoping to kind of get something developed uh, before the centre gets to know about it. I think if you have um, vice presidents like Timmermans and Vestager um, and Dombrovskis um, directly working with DGs alongside their commissioner, it can lead to friction, but it can also lead to, um, I think, much more coherent policy making. And I would hope that the system will will, will be able to put the to move the indicator more to the coherent side because um, I do worry uh, the last two commissions have worked very hard to try to limit the number of priorities the commission engages in because if you have 150 priorities on your agenda you cannot explain to anybody what it is you're trying to achieve if you have a limited number of priorities that you can show the machinery is behind then you have some chance of of delivering on it and being able to explain to the public and of course the new commission is going to have to work with a new parliament, where uh, a more fragmented parliament than previously, because you now have three and a half main parties, um, the half being the Greens. Um, so it will, be, it will take more work at compromise. It will probably make the compromises more complicated and more difficult to explain to the public at a time when everybody wants a simple soundbite to explain, you know, what's Europe doing, what's it all about. It will be more complicated, but I still think that the centre um, will achieve majorities on the big and important issues. And of course, the first battle will be to decide, do they approve the commission or do they take out one or two commissioners? Immediately followed by um, the battle on the future budget, which is where the parliament does have a lot of power and will have the opportunity to exercise it if it's able to, to get its act together and to organise. Um, very briefly, we have also have a new president of the European Council, um, somebody steeped in a European federalist tradition. So you can expect um, him, I think, to be um, keen on what generally people talk about as more Europe. Um, but I think also being a Belgian politician, somebody who will be very pragmatic and who I believe will be um, skilled in the usual Belgian talent of finding compromises. Um, but it will be very important that the President of the Commission, the President of the European Council work together. I've seen when they didn't and when they did, and the difference is enormous. Um, so hopefully that will work. And then, not forgetting the new President of the ECB, um, it will be interesting to see whether Christine Lagarde, once she gets there, is more French or more IMF, and that, or maybe hopefully a combination of both, I think. But um, that will also be a change. Um, because the European Council has been, got very used to Mario Draghi over the last several years through the whole Euro crisis. Um, and we still will have um, more work to do on co 
consolidating the euro, um, on looking at whether or not we need a, an economic stimulus package, um, depending also on the fallout from Brexit, etc. So a lot of new people um, coming to tackle old problems, but as I said, hopefully in a new way. And with the stakes as high as they've ever been, um, because um, not only is it does the EU need to reach out to its citizens and convince voters um, that it is the best way forward, but also to be able to resist the, um, the intense pressure from outside to try to undermine and destabilise it at a time when um, it's, it's going to lose an important member. Um, in lots of ways, and I'll, I'll, I will stop here, in lots of ways the departure of the UK, which will be a huge loss, um, but it will also lead to, I think, a more coherent EU in the sense that it will be much more continental. And one of the things I'd like to have a discussion with you about is to what extent do you think Ireland is ready for that? Um, and what do we need to do both in our, let's say, business, political, professional lives to make sure that Ireland locks into that more continental EU um, and how are we going to bring our citizens along that journey? Um, because at the moment everybody is um, super European um, in, in all the opinion polls. But you know, the first thing that will go wrong, and inevitably things do go wrong, we could then have quite a backlash here. So it would be interesting to have a discussion with you about how do you think um, we can get more ready and sustain um, a much higher level of public interest in the EU and our our involvement in it um, once the immediate focus of Brexit begins to decline, which hopefully one of these days it will. So thank you very much for your attention.